Doctor's Kitchen. Recipes, health, lifestyle. My dad was he hugging me really tightly in that oven, um, trying to save me if anything had happened to him. And that's exactly what he told me as well, that if anything happens to me, make sure you take your family and you take them back to Kabul, Afghanistan. So you don't go back to Pakistan. You go straight to there and tell your uncle to, to look after you and make sure you look after them. And I think that was one of the moments when I realized that actually I was second in command for the family as well, even at the age of five, that if anything happened to dad, I had to take the, the leadership to, to lead my family in, in war. Welcome to the Doctor's Kitchen podcast. The show about food, lifestyle, medicine, and how to improve your health today. I'm Dr. Rupi, your host. I'm a medical doctor. I study nutrition, and I'm a firm believer in the power of food and lifestyle as medicine. Join me and my expert guests where we discuss the multiple determinants of what allows you to lead your best life. Today, you will listen to one of the most incredible stories, so much so that it genuinely sounds as unbelievable as the plot of a Hollywood movie, such as the journey of my friend and colleague, Dr. Waheed Ariam. He was born and raised in Afghanistan, and Waheed's Childhood was spent fleeing from conflict, and as early as the age of five, he and his family fled their hometown in Kabul for the refugee camps of Pakistan, taking the treacherous journey through the harsh terrain, all whilst dodging bombs and the Taliban. Once reaching the camps, his family had to do further battles with malaria, TB, all without access to medicine and proper health care. His childhood is littered with these experiences and fearing for his life, where he'd actually managed to escape Afghanistan, leaving his family in Kabul at the age of 15, just before he would have been conscripted by the Taliban to fight. He managed to find safety in the UK and he actually started working multiple low wage jobs in the London area, sending all of his earnings back to support his family in the war zones. But he also decided to formally learn English and complete his A and AS levels. And this is where the story gets even more astonishing. He applied to medicine and through sheer determination, he managed to achieve a place at Cambridge. He completed his clinical work at Imperial. And this is where myself and Wahid actually crossed paths in the same year group and did an elective at Harvard. And if none of this was impressive enough, Wahid went on to start radiology training and founded his pioneering charity, Arian Teleheal. And this works directly with clinicians on the ground and provides governments and global organizations with a blueprint for delivering innovative healthcare and education. So through a network of volunteers in the UK, doctors across Afghanistan have access to highly skilled and trained clinicians via encrypted social media platforms. Wahid has since been recognized as a UNESCO Global Hope Hero, a UN Global Goals Goalkeeper, and he was appointed to the WHO roster of digital health experts in 2019. In the UK, he's been awarded the Rotary International Peace Award and the Prime Minister's Points of Light Award. He was also working throughout the pandemic in A&E in his hometown and has not stopped working on his charity ambitions ever since. And we talk about a number of things today, largely centered around Wahid's story and how the seed of ambition was planted actually by a doctor that treated him for TB when he was just six And we also talk about how refugees are important and why it's critical to fight for their rights. The legendary BBC reporter John Simpson has actually told his story in a BBC documentary called Wahid's Wars, the link to which is all on the show notes at thedoctorskitchen.com, as is a link to his latest book, In the Wars, which is available in all good bookstores and online. And I highly, highly recommend you read Wahid's book. It is quite simply one of the most inspirational stories I've ever read, and it has touched me deeply. It has helped me and my gratitude practice immensely. The sound of today's podcast changes around an hour in. Um, We had a few audio difficulties, but nothing that should dissuade you from listening throughout 
the whole podcast and right to the end. And I have one ask that you support Waheed, you go follow him on socials. And also if you're enjoying the show, please do rate, review, and do send this to a friend who needs to hear it because it's quite simply one of the most incredible stories. You can also join the doctorskitchen.com newsletter where I give you suggestions on what you should eat, listen, or watch every week. And something that I believe is important for health and well-being. And hopefully it will give you some impetus every single week to do something new and something that helps your mental well-being. Anyway, that is enough from me for this intro. I really hope you enjoy Wahid's story and uh, enjoy our chat. I'm basically just going to ask you a bunch of questions and just let you talk and just tell your story because it's, and I mean this, man, it's so powerful for a number of reasons for people who want to go into medicine, who feel that they need a step up, who need motivation, you know, who might be refugees themselves. Like there's just so many elements of your story and the way it's been written and put together, it's just incredible. So I want to give you as much time to, to talk through it and we could talk about obviously the charity, uh, ways to support, uh, and anything else that you want to talk about as well. So, so yeah, man, this is this is really just your chance to speak to my audience, and I want to try and promote it as much and as much as possible. That's very kind of you, Rupi. Um, that's uh, I think that what I'll do is I'll go chronologically from the beginning, the start, and there will be themes that will come out uh, that I would like to summarize. For example, hope, um, dreams mental health mm. issues, refugee camp situation. So I think that way we wouldn't miss um, anything. But uh, anything you want to focus more, um, you can stop me and then we can kind of like discuss, uh, go, for example, PTSD. We're talking about, uh, I've made a note here of as well, that how, for example, I had late night uh, uh, food habits. Uh, com- food oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I had that. So for example, that is topic relevant here that we can discuss yeah, the connection between the mind and the nutrition and exercise and my coping mechanism for mental health as well of how yeah, I was using yeah, that definitely. as well. So we'll go through them. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Because it seemed like uh, exercise, particularly uh, Taekwondo, was was a really good avenue for you to try and help you get through your PTSD. and. It was. Taekwondo was. Um, I learned actually kicks and uh, some of the moves from uh, Jackie Chan moves, uh, movies as well as Bruce Lee. Oh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> I learned some That's of really, really some of the kicks later on that when I was uh, being trained properly, they were looking at some of my kicks. They were weird. Some of them were wonderful, but some of them were weird. And <laughs> and the instructor, he was like, "Who taught you that kick?" <laughs> Did you say Jackie Chan? <laughs> yeah, because I would just like see that he could do that move, you know go on the wall and then flip back and I was like I can do it too and then I was like obviously I'll bash my head uh, I will fall on the floor and then my mom will get annoyed you know what's this noise coming from and the pillows everywhere but kind of um, but I learned some some really cool tricks and some not really cool I had to relearn some of the kicks the techniques back and and so on but that's I think one of the mechanisms as well that during wartime we didn't have access to playing we didn't have access to outside we were not going to school much so we had to find something to t- entertain ourselves with uh, and at home that was one of the things that kind of we're watching movies um, stay at home and then kind of create this imaginary world where everything was okay everything was fine for us um, to separate uh, what was going on on the outside yeah do you see do you, do you think that still happens um today like when, whenever you see children on the news and, and my position is obviously from my sheltered home watching it on tv and i see children in during famine in in conflict zones and a lot of some are obviously not not the uh, atrocities and, and the ap- apocalyptic scenes but sometimes you see kids and they are laughing and smiling and and jumping around in, in front of the camera and, and stuff like that and they they seem very very happy it, do, do you see that as like a coping mechanism? Is, is, is it just like the way children are? They can, they can imagine and, and visualize the, um, the, 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 their own environment? That's a very good point, actually. I think um, it also applies, to, obviously it applies to conflict zones. But if you go to some parts where there's extreme poverty, um, for example, some parts in Africa, some parts in India, 
you actually see that those people have got a huge smile on them uh, on their faces they they will still interact with you they will be happy to receive you they will be happy to um tell you about their lives to tell you about what they are going on to do and so on one i think consciously um i'm not sure if it is one of their coping mechanisms but subconsciously they one they're born into that reality of whether it's poverty whether it's conflict so for them to see somebody else coming and as a guest or for them to see uh to find pleasure or to find comfort in in the small things that we take for granted in life is actually what it's all about for them so for us we didn't know when the fighting would end or start usually we would be in the cellars hiding from the daily rockets and the bombs but some days when the fighting wasn't there that was really a good day for us so we will be smiling we'll be happy but in the grand scheme of things if you look at it from the outside you'll be saying why are you happy about you know the conflict is all, still ongoing but from day to day we would find a burst of um times where we could find comfort in each other we find um humor in small things we would make jokes about small things and that's how actually what one of the subconscious coping mechanism that humans have actually um the one thing i've later on on reflection i've realized is that it's uh, humans have got so much potential in so many avenues they've got so much resilience uh, that if need be if you're pushed uh, we can actually tap into them we can use that resilience um and and i think that's something that i brought with me back when i came to the uk what i'll talk about later on is that um the the idea of not to give up the idea of always to keep pushing that there will be better days is actually stemming from that of not having hope not having anything but then the next day there will be a hope uh, of so on so having talked about that then i was uh, born in uh, 1983 during the afghan soviet conflict um in afghanistan so i was born into war i didn't have any other reality that was my reality when i which i was born into um and the first 5 years um i remember hiding with with our family members in one room or another or in cellars uh, from the rockets from the shelling and also from the tanks that were kind of making noise outside for the helicopters gunships uh, and the planes the soviet jets making uh, noises in, in the air well i had no clue what was going on so i would usually ask mom what's happening and she would say oh it's just fireworks outside it's nothing so that was another way that how they would uh, try parents would try to comfort us and they did an amazing job uh, for us and that's usually when we see parents trying to protect their families in in conflict zones it, i'm absolutely blown away by the sheer resilience they have by the sheer kindness they they, they use uh, and their compassion and passion they they use to protect the the children and to provide for them in the extreme conditions we didn't have a lot of things usually my mother she would go out and find jackets on the street or uh, some clothes that were exported from uh, europe or exported from russia or from some other country uh, when kind of it's redundant here but obviously in those countries that's exactly what we used to wear they would they would be holes here uh, or tears and and so on but that didn't matter what mattered for us was were we actually warm in winter um it went as um, the temperatures go beyond freezing so and also we didn't have a lot of food obviously what uh, were given to us was um completely below standard but that's what kept us going um and parents again play a huge part in that making sure that uh, we get the nutrition uh, as much as possible while starving themselves so after about 5 years um we decided all of us to go back to to pakistan and the reason for that was because my father was fleeing from the military service he couldn't be with the family so we had to go and meet in uh, a location a hidden location which was another province so we were living in uh, kabul uh, in a capital and my father was in hiding in logar province um quite a few kilometers away from the kabul and he would go back and forth to pakistan to make some money bring that money back during summer time when the heat was too much He'd give that money to my mom so she would support us and he would go back in hiding and so finally they decided that it was too much for everybody so we had to go to to pakistan to live together and that's where most of the refugees at that time went millions of refugees they fled to afghanistan because of the ongoing conflict so we took a very dangerous route because my, we couldn't go 
through the usual border. The usual border was closed. The families were not allowed to flee to Pakistan. So we had to use very dangerous routes from mountains, through um, rivers. And the journey was actually at night. And the reason for that was that any movement that was seen during the day, the helicopter gunships and the planes would come in and attack and destroy with the families, children. Uh, that was the same route used by the rebels at the time as well. So they wouldn't discriminate necessarily whether it was a rebel or uh, whether it was uh, a family that was uh, trying to flee conflict uh, there. Um, and it took about seven days, seven nights. Uh, we came under the attack about three times. Uh, miraculously, we survived those attacks along the way. Um, and we made it to Pakistan uh, to a refugee camp. And that's when we arrived, the rockets and the bombs and the shelling stopped. But the horrendous conditions in the refugee camp actually started. They were far worse than the conditions um, beyond conflict that we had seen in, in Afghanistan. So many families, they would be using one or two tents um, for the entire family. Um, again, lack of uh, nutrition, lack of sanitation, um, no clean water for them. And um, they had to make use of whatever they had. So they brought very few clothes with them from uh, uh, with their families from Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, But what they would usually bring with them is that hope, that dream that you know, we've survived war now, we've, we're safe in Pakistan, let's make our lives better. So they wouldn't kind of say that, oh my God, we've come to this, these conditions, what do we do now? So they would always seem to think positively, and that was the attitude my parents had as well. They would tell us that, come on, although the conditions are really bad here, but at least we are safe, the bombs are not here. So that's kind of like positive, changing a, a negative situation into positive by hanging on to the small threads of hope here and there, but also using the, the small things, the day-to-day -day things that we usually um, take for granted actually here. Because in the, in the book, you describe your father as having this irrepressible, optimistic attitude. And I wonder if that was something that was distinct for, for him as a person, or is this something that you've noticed uh, in other families, in the refugee camps, and, and other people in general who, who've experienced the, the conflict zones in Afghanistan? That's a good point. I think uh, it was pretty distinctive for my father, uh, but also I've seen that uh, trend actually in many people who lived through conflict, who lived through um, really adverse conditions. They do develop that sense of optimism, uh, trying not to give up. Uh, one, they may not have any other choice because either it's that or death or completely giving up on their families. Um, or alternatively, it's uh, uh, it, it's something that's kind of, they've been pushed to build that attitude because of the environment, the conditions. Uh, but my, my dad seems to have that. Uh, he had that from a younger age, I think. Uh, he still has that with him. Whenever I consult him, I still do consult him for things as well. He's got a very um, optimistic uh, attitude to him. Uh, telling me that everything will be okay, one day there will be peace. Uh, Afghanistan is still in, in, in war for more than four decades. Um, and he usually would listen to a radio, a small radio, telling us that uh, he's heard some good news, despite listening to it for an hour, listening to bad news. But he would still try to find that one bit of good news uh, on the radio and tell us that, oh, that there is a uh, hope that we might be able to go back to Kabul, to Afghanistan, and there would be peace. So back in the refugee camp, when we were living there, um, as a huge family of eight um, in one muddy room, and uh, the conditions, temperatures were rising up to 45 degrees centigrade, with little food, uh, lack of sanitation, no clean water, and some rations that were given to us uh, by um, the UN Refugee Agency, um, that was what was kept us going. But again, I think despite all those conditions, what... On reflection, I, I find amazing is the hospitality of the local people. That's, I think, where humanity matters as well. They felt, they knew that we were suffering back in Afghanistan and that we had fled war. So they did show us compassion. Our neighbors didn't have much. Uh, the local Pakistani people didn't have much, but whatever they had, they would try to share with us. For example, we didn't have electricity in the, when we moved from a refugee camp to um another area called Badabira. And the reason for that was because I contracted tuberculosis. So we had to relocate. 
So I remember that our neighbor um, gave us electricity. So there was a fan for us because we couldn't afford electricity and there was no electricity there. They would also allow us to use some of the, the clean water they had uh, or many other things. So these are small things that I'm mentioning here, but how the refugees obviously integrated back in Pakistan. They started giving back to the local communities, they build shops, they build businesses, uh, but also the people, uh, local people from um, whatever city people were living at, they would be welcoming refugees, they would be trying to make them as comfortable as possible. Uh, and ultimately, they, they became sort of a, a community that you wouldn't be able to distinguish too much. Of course, one from Afghanistan, the other from Pakistan, but they had a lot of things in common in that sense. The basic universal human values, I would yeah. say. It's incredible, isn't it, that you, in the middle of uh, conflict, you see both the worst and the best of human nature. You see abhorrent fighting and apocalyptic scenes, but at the same time, you see incredible gestures of humanity like you just described there. And I just want to zoom in on the fact that you got TB as well, because I believe you were about six at the time. And you, obviously being in a refugee camp, there's medication shortages, you know, there's uh, conditions that are unsanitary. I mean, wh what was that experience like for you if, you, if you can remember? Soon after arrival, most of my family members and I, we suffered from malaria first, actually, because of the uh, um, lack of sanitation, the huge... Uh, number of mosquitoes, um, especially in refugee camps. We didn't know what it was, but it was soon we started suffering from high and low temperatures, uh, vomiting, body aches. Um, and the people knew locally that that's actually, these are the symptoms uh, for malaria. We would go to a local pharmacist and they would give it just medicine. There were no proper treatments for malaria, but most people would survive and some people wouldn't survive. We don't know exactly what the death uh, toll was from that. But after have, suffering from that, um, I think a few months uh, that we were living in the refugee camp, I started develop, developing a cough, which went on for quite a while. It wouldn't settle. And it was a cough that actually, with that cough, I started losing weight. I had night sweats with it. Uh, and after about a few weeks, I started bringing up some blood with it as well. And that was a very worrying sign for my parents. Uh, we went to, he took me to, uh, my parents took me to the local doctor in the refugee camp and when i saw that there was a huge queue waiting for that doctor um for, for thousands of refugees there's just one doctor in, in a muddy room sitting there and trying to examine trying to help people but i still saw actually a smile on his face uh, i saw that he was still being very kind to people he wasn't feeling tired and that kind of made me very curious and why is this person so happy uh despite that being so he should be tired uh, but he was still, and then he, when he examined me, he told my dad that um, he he had to take me to a pulmonologist, to a chest specialist, uh, because he suspected that it would be something serious. He didn't spell it out what it would be, but he said, it is. I think it's something serious and you need to go to see a lung specialist. But whilst that experience was something that actually slowly made me curious about medicine, uh, the power of medicine, of how it can actually heal people and the effects that it has on the people who are practicing it. Uh, so that was kind of the first seeds. But then I was suffering so badly that my dad took me to the pulmonologist in Khaybar Bazar in Peshawar City. Uh, we went there uh, and when I saw the chest specialist, again, I saw a lot of kindness in his eyes and his touch when he was examining my chest. He was listening to my chest. Yeah, he asked my dad to go to the local shop there to get my x-ray. So that's how the x-rays are done. You're seen in one room and then the next uh, room you go and then you pay for your x-ray. Your x-ray is taken. You bring back the x-ray. You put it up uh, on a, a white screen. And that's how we examined the x-ray and he checked my weight. Then he asked me to go out to another room whilst he was chatting with my dad. I could just really listen to what he was talking about a little bit as well. And he told my dad that uh, there's quite a high chance of uh, losing your son if we don't treat him uh, now, probably 60%, 70%. But because the condition actually is really bad, he's lost a lot of weight. He doesn't have a lot of uh, um, body nutrition or, or nutrient in, in his body to fight actually this on his own. So he definitely needs to take the medicine and also get all the relevant nutrients for it as well. When my dad came out, I didn't know what was going on. 
but I saw the doctor was really kind to me and he said, like, I'll see you soon in a few weeks time. I'd like to you to to make sure that you take all the medicine that dad gives you, take all the milk and uh, the meat that dad is going to buy you. Uh, and I would like to ask you these questions. So that's kind of the, the start of interaction between me and that, that doctor. But when we came back to the house, everybody was crying. I had no idea why they were crying. Uh, of course, they, they hid it from me. And later on, I found out that they knew that there was 60-70% of chance of dying. And many other children died. So miraculously, I survived. Uh, it's because my parents put uh, a lot of effort into treating me, giving me the medicine, taking me back and forth to the doctor, giving me the, the nutrients that I needed. But n- many children die. Um, they do still in villages and in areas where they don't have access to good healthcare, they don't have access to good nutrition. I'm sure you know this uh, better than I do, that how important nutrition is, uh, in when, especially when people are suffering from um, acute conditions to, to enable their bodies to fight back. It's not just the medicine. We also need good nutrition for it as well. And that's what kept me going and miraculously I survived that. But that second interaction that I had with a doctor, which kept on and on because I had to keep going every uh, month of, or every two months to be weighed. Uh, we had a, um, discussions about what medicine was, what he was doing, what he was, he had, uh, of, he was using a stethoscope to listen to my lungs. And I was asking, what's that tube? He would let me listen to him, to himself and my dad. Then one day when I went in, he gave me a stethoscope. He had bought me actually from the local shop. A stethoscope. He said, like, you can keep listening to your dad now. Uh, he also gave me an old uh, black and white book with a lot of images, pictures. He said, like, this is going to be your uh, medical book. That's your stethoscope. And your dad will get you some syringes as well that you can play with. So they actually became, <laughs> they actually became my toys because in the refugee camp, we didn't have any toys. Uh, we couldn't just go out um, to to play freely. Um, it's it's one we didn't know many people around. Secondly, that it's everybody is suffering in one way or another. Uh, people are completely coming from a shock of conflict, having lost family members, having lost everything. So they can't just build rebuild their lives so easily. Uh, they come in with so much mental trauma, with with uh, so much suffering that they're just content with with staying indoors and kind of surviving and and in some ways reliving the trauma in their minds as well what exactly happened so that was actually when i became inspired to become a doctor to see the healing that i saw the power of the healing of how he treated me how he saved my life and how those doctors can actually save the lives of many other people who are suffering even more than we did yeah that's it's incredible i i remember in the book you you wrote that was the pivotal change the seed of ambition that was planted by that the, those doctors um at, at such a young tender age and, and and it seems like you've held on to that ambition and that dream of being a doctor throughout your journey that thus thus far right absolutely i hung on to it subconsciously i was inspired but there were so many challenges ahead uh, after we went back to afghanistan from the refugee camp staying for about two and a half years there. We went and my dad was above the age of military service, so he could go back. We could all go back to uh, Kabul. But within a year, the civil war broke out inside. Um, and from 92 all the way to 99, that civil war carried on. And it was really bloody fight, the streets from, uh, from, from one street to another, uh, amongst so many rebel groups that we didn't know who was fighting who. But all we had to do was, again, to hide in the cellars from the daily rockets, the bombs. But then we had to also flee from one part of the city to another. Because one day, one part of the city was calm. The next day, it wasn't. So the the fighting was uh, going on in that part. And so many people died. So many people lost their, their, their relatives and their friends. Um, and, and for us to be able to find safety, just, just to survive was the key important point um actually the 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 crucial point was was for us just to be um to stay alive then we internally displaced we went back to logar province to other areas um, in afghanistan uh, to survive Uh, and we went back to Uh, how are you moving uh, moving about throughout those different areas of of afghanistan what what, what, where where would you stay where would you sleep when you had to move from a a one conflict zone to the next well that's something that uh, i'm glad you mentioned usually in in 
during wartime, the main objective is to stay alive. Everything else becomes secondary. Mm. Whether you find a house, whether you find a tent, whether you find a relative's house, or or you find uh, an unknown person who just welcomes you. Again, compassion. People show compassion. People show kindness in those desperate times. People will just go knock on the door, like, I've come from that part of the city. Can you just give me shelter? People will welcome them in their houses, not having known them at all. But they knew that the fighting was ongoing and they need support. So nobody would shut their doors on anybody. Um, wow. And the primary objective, obviously, was to stay alive, to, to dodge the bullets or dodge the bomb. And it was how my dad would used to listen to the radio uh, to find out anything from the news that who was fighting who or where the, the fighting might come. So it was a lot of guessing game as well, that the fighting is getting closer here and another area is a bit uh, calmer. Uh, and they would just go out, the men would talk amongst each other and then they would decide the next day that, okay, we have to now move from this part, go somewhere else. And we had very little with us as well. Um, very few clothes that we would carry. We knew what the bags were. We didn't have uh, huge cartons or boxes and everything for moving out the way we do here, for example. And that's it. You get your bags, you move uh, from that part which is under fire, go somewhere else just to be able to survive. And that's exactly what's going on at the moment in the conflict zones. And that's why refugees flee. They flee primarily for their safety, primarily for to, to be able to live. They don't actually leave their houses, their belongings that they've worked so hard for. They don't leave just their friends, their family members to go somewhere else to have a better life. It's not mm. the case. Um, as we discussed early on, many people are happy where they're born. Many people are happy to be surrounded by friends, family members that they've known all their lives. That's actually what um, good living is. It's not about having the everything that or a lot of the things, materialistic things, that they may not necessarily need. It's actually the meaningful stuff, the, the, the stuff that actually what makes us humans. But they leave everything behind for one reason, for safety, to, to mm. flee war, to flee persecution, to find safety. And that's what exactly we did internally, whether we, when we displaced uh, in Afghanistan or later on when we um, migrated to Pakistan. And mm. finally, when uh, I left Afghanistan to come to the UK, Again, it was to flee war uh, and, and to find safety in the first instance. And then secondly, to follow my ambition uh, or to find actually if I could achieve my dream. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this because I think particularly in this country, there is a rhetoric around immigration migrants that they come to the UK for a better life monetarily or we have a welfare system that they can utilize to their advantage etc cetera, etc cetera. and i think you know just by virtue of you telling your story about how you went to pakistan and then back to afghanistan even though you knew that there was still some um you know sensitivities around conflict and stuff that's where you're from that's where you wanted to be people don't leave those areas because of a better life in the UK, you know, there's so much more to, to life and community and where you are and friendships that that's what, what grounds people. Absolutely. Exactly what you've mentioned. It's actually family members. It's the community. It's the, the, the friends that you've known all your lives that actually what makes living enjoyable, what living is about, that you see happiness on each other's faces and you use the little you have to make a, a good life for yourself or where you belong. But they don't leave all that to come somewhere else to find a better life. Uh, some people do, uh, so I don't disagree with that. Some people, they do. But for us to find out who's actually fleeing persecution, fleeing war, or somebody else who is fleeing not persecution or war, but they're just coming to have a better life, that requires a proper assessment. That requires mm. safeguards. That requires systems which are robust to make sure that it doesn't infringe upon the human rights of the many people, uh, the, the thousands upon thousands of people who actually flee war. And we, so we can't label everybody as having fled uh, to come to, to the UK or another country for a better life uh, and vice versa as well. I fully agree that there has to be a discrimination with that. But for, for us, in order to do that, we can't create umbrella systems to brand mm. something or to, to say that 
from now on, nobody can cross the channel because uh, it's going to uh, deter human traffickers. That sort of using an umbrella statement never works. We are humans. Each one of these people who are taking these very dangerous journeys to come here, they do it for a reason. And that's what we need to find. We need to find out exactly their life stories, exactly that you're talking to me, you're finding about my life story. Every refugee has a story. Um, and, and the only way for us to tell that is that if we have a good uh, application system, a good um, a humane system where they can be treated as humans, they can be looked after mentally, physically, and, and socially. And, and that's actually the basis of their, their health as well in the first place. Then we would be able to tell you know, who requires support, what sort of support they require. And amongst them, if there are some who are not really, shouldn't be here, then fair enough. Uh, they could be mm-hmm. given protections, given safeguards um, and, and, and all that. They could be returned back to places where they're safe. But not everybody. We can't label everybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I want to get on to the part of your story where you come to the UK, but there was one thing that you uh, talked about in your NHS TED Talk that I, I watched, I had the privilege of watching a few years ago now, where you describe an incident uh, where you're, you're traveling, uh, migrating a- away from uh, your, your hometown in Afghanistan, and you come into contact with a Russian helicopter and you and your father dive into shelter in a, in a, in a household that's been abandoned. Can, can you talk about that for a second? It was um, the journey that we took from uh, Loga province to uh, migrate to Pakistan. So that was our first migration to Pakistan at the age of five. And again, because the borders were closed, we couldn't take the usual borders. We had to take a night and day journey on donkeys and horses with uh, another 20 families as a caravan. Uh, we had guides uh, and um, with us, we took some bread that was oil bread. Uh, apart from that, we didn't have anything else. So that was our nutrition for the way. And we would usually find water here and there. So the journey was at night and at daytime, we would find somewhere to sleep. And when we were traveling for about three or four nights, suddenly in, in, in the early hours of one morning, uh, when it was quite light, um, everybody decided that we had to hide now. And they found some bushes where the children and women could uh, stay. The men went out to the local village to find somewhere we could uh, uh, actually sleep during that day. So at night time, we could uh, start our journey back. And I went with my dad with a few men as well there. But, so that's when we were spotted by a spy plane. We were spotted and my dad knew that um, as soon as he heard the noise of the spy plane, that within minutes, the jets would arrive and the helicopter gunships would arrive. Uh, so he took me with him um in his arms he ran i had no clue what was going on but he ran really fast towards the village he didn't return back to the bushes because i think he realized that he might endanger everybody else's life all the children and women who were hiding in in those bushes so we went to the village um he knocked on one door he that was closed he found another house that was abandoned and in that house he was searching for somewhere uh, and i didn't know again what he was searching for he found an oven on the ground and he took me in that oven uh, and then he hit me there uh, in the oven and within a minute or so the uh, helicopter gunships and the jets actually arrived first the jets arrived and they started the bombardment and we could actually feel the whole earth moving with every bomb that was coming down we could actually feel the bullets and that was uh, being showered on us on the um, ceilings of the, the muddy house there. Of course, I'd, I'd close my eyes and my dad was, he hugging me really tightly in that oven, um, trying to save me if anything had happened to him. And that's exactly what he told me as well, that if anything happens to me, make sure you take your family and you take them back to Kabul, Afghanistan. So you don't go back to Pakistan. You go straight to there and tell your uncle to, to look after you and make sure you look after them. And I think that was one of the moments when I realized that actually I was second in command for the family as well, even at the age of five, that if anything happened to dad, I had to take the, the leadership to, to lead my family in, in war. So miraculously, we survived that attack. Uh, and uh, after about a few minutes when the bombardment finished, then the helicopter gunships, they came in and they used artillery to fire indiscriminately all around. Um, 
I think they were thinking that they were the Mujahideen were there and they were using that village to attack the government forces. So they wanted to destroy anything that was uh, on the ground. So those were sort of miraculous moments that we survived. Um, many people were not that um, lucky to survive that. So along the way, we did see some human remains. Uh, I would ask my parents, you know, who they belonged to. And they, they said, oh, these are just animal remains. But they, actually, you could see that the bones didn't look like the animal bones. So many people died um, on those journeys, uh, sadly. Mm, yeah. I mean, that that incident is just one of so many that you describe in the book of of near misses. You know, there's, there's another where there was a bombing across the road from your house and, you know, you're seeing the children play just, just before. And it just, you know... You, it just demonstrates just how arduous your journey has been and how unbelievable it is to get to your position now. And, 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 you know, we're telling your story chronologically. It's really hard not to jump around because there's so many elements of it. It's just that are just absolutely miraculous and just completely unbelievable. It is miraculous. Thank you, Rupi. It is miraculous, but I'd like to make a point here as well that people keep going through the same journeys on a daily basis now. I think that's why we see this um, the, the refugee crisis. Uh, the world is not uh, getting any better, sadly. There are the, the increasing incidents of conflicts from Syria to Afghanistan. Um, and then you see them in, in parts of uh, Iraq, uh, as well as in Africa, in many other places. So I think that's where we really need to understand what the people who flee conflict go through. And hopefully that uh, my book can detail that journey. But so it's not Although it's it's my story, but I I hope that people can see the journey of millions of other refugees through what I'm describing in that book. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's get to, to the part in, in the book now where you, where you make the decision to come to the UK. What what spurred that decision on, and and how how did you get about doing that? Because it just seems so far removed to even be able to have the opportunity to 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 come here. So before making that decision, we. Um, during the internal war, um, when we went back to Kabul, Afghanistan, the uh, civil war that started, we migrated again to Pakistan. We went back to the refugee camp because the war was uh, so bad. And back in the refugee camp, because I was old enough at that time to um, look for education, to look for some sort that I could do something with my life. I know subconsciously I wanted to become a doctor, but I had no clue where to go about it. The schools in Afghanistan were shut. Usually we would, when, whenever we had a chance to come in, we would talk with each other to find out who'd lost family members, who'd lost friends. And the teacher would be telling us stories about conflict. It was not about math, science, or um, any of that. Uh, so most of my education did happen during conflict. It was in cellars. Whatever books I could find on the streets, I would just grab them or my dad would grab them for me and uh, I would just start reading them uh, at nighttime Um whether it, when the bombing was not there, it would go upstairs into a room, and when the bombing was there, we would go into the, um, a cellar with a lamp to read whatever I could under a desk. So that was when I became so inspired to find ways so I can educate myself, opportunities, and I was absolutely thirsty for those opportunities. So when we back to when we went to Pakistan to uh, refugee camp again, I looked for those opportunities where I could uh, study. Uh, and there was um, a, a center, an institute, they call it uh, um, Islamic University. It wasn't actually a proper university. So it was an institute where you could go and get educated. So I started uh, um, reading, preparing for that. It had an entrance exam. Uh, I went to a local school and I told them that, yes, I've done my schooling in Kabul, Afghanistan. I just wanted to bypass the whole thing. And uh, they uh, asked me, OK, the exam is in two months time. I had to prepare for the school. Um, matriculation exam uh, actually they pass almost everybody because they just wanted to sell the certificate so they gave me a certificate as well I went into this institute uh, It's uh, it was supposed to be a medical school but it wasn't a medical school but it was uh, mainly teaching us right from the start of uh, how a cell works and the, the basics of biology the basics of uh, chemistry, maths and so on and that's actually one and a half year that I remember that I had good education over there uh, which was the equivalent of GCC, but the rest of my education was all over the place. Uh, so I, I learned a lot of things the wrong way and uh, many things uh, the right way. Uh, but and during that uh, one, one and a half year, when I got the foundation of the science, um, I equipped myself with that. 
But then I had to give it up. I had to give it up because I didn't find the reason for me to continue for another five years uh, learning at this Islamic university because the certificate was not useful anywhere. It was not even acceptable in Pakistan to practice as a doctor. So it was only acceptable in the refugee camp. Even it was not acceptable back in war in Afghanistan. So I had to abandon that and kind of my hopes got smashed completely to pieces. Not being able to find a way to study medicine. I went back to Kabul. Uh, the Taliban were in power at that time. Uh, and I was helping my dad uh, drive his taxi as well from time to time. I had no license, but there was hardly anybody on the streets. And it was the Taliban that we had to take from one part of the city to another. And they would be paying us. And back there, I realized that there was a threat to my life uh, soon that I would be recruited to fight um, on the front line and not being able to achieve my dream to become a doctor because the universities were shut. There was hardly any education. So the combination of trying to survive one and then being able to find somewhere that I can educate myself was the motivation for me to flee Afghanistan. But we didn't know how to do it. There was no way, there was no easy way to do it. You can't just go to an embassy. And that's exactly the point um, I really would like to emphasize here as well. There are no legal routes for refugees to flee conflict zone. Uh, I know I'm talk talking about my story here, but the case is still present. Uh, I talk to my family members in Afghanistan. I talk to people uh, in conflict zones through our charity, International Telemedicine Charity, that we do. There are no proper resettlement routes available now we they're talking about the re resettling uh, for example the interpreters who'd worked with um, the british army who'd worked with the american forces but such systems were not available uh, at those at that time and how about the millions of other people or the thousands of other people who uh, need to survive there are no legal routes for them we didn't have any route so we had to find ask local people how they managed to flee the country uh, and one of the people who I was studying with uh, in Shamshatu camp, in the refugee camp in Pakistan, I'd heard about him. He was, his name uh, is Hakim, that he'd fled to, to the UK. I spoke with him on the phone and he told me, yes, uh, life is um, in the UK. They're very hospitable. Um, they're very compassionate and they allow me to work. And, they, um, and I asked him, can you study? He said, yeah, I can study. I'm not studying, but yes, you can study. So for me, that was at the back of my mind, two things. One. It's, it's safe that I can flee conflict. Secondly, there was an opportunity for me to study. Uh, so that was uh, something I, I really aspired to do, to flee the country. Uh, but then we had to find ways to do it, and I had to find uh, people um, which later on turned out to be human smugglers, to which asked for a lot of money. Initially, they sold the concept to us saying that you will be, we're going to get you a refugee status visa all the way from one of the countries, which would be UK, Germany, or America. Um, but it will cost you a lot of money, and it will cost you some time as well because they will assess you and all that. So and that brings me to another point, that refugees don't really necessarily understand the, the parts they take, the routes they take. They're so desperate to, to flee conflict that they would take any route. Yet it's the, the alternative is dying. So from that, any other route goes. Hence, a lot of people, they take these really dangerous journeys, whether through sea, through air, to flee conflict and to find safety. And that's what happened with me, that we paid a lot of money, um, thinking that the visa that was given to me was actually a refugee status from the UK. It, later on, it turned out not to be a refugee status. It was a fake password that was um, uh, given to me by the human smuggler. And he was, it was a human smuggler. And uh, But it got me to the UK here, and that's uh, back in the UK, I found that out, that uh, how much of a risk I had taken by my parents selling the house to, to selling everything they had to get that visa for me in order for me to flee the country for my safety and then to be able to pursue my dreams here. Yeah, yeah. I, I think any family listening to this will do exactly the same thing. And to give some context, you know, the reason why initially your family fled Afghanistan was because your father was of conscription age and you only returned until he was past that age. And you were coming up to the same issue, that red flag of, of you know, you being conscripted to work, uh, to, to uh, be part of the military. 
Um, and it's uh, it, it's incredible that you know your your family made such sacrifices to do that. But like I said, it, it's something that everyone would want to do and aspire to do if they had the chance to do so. And when you got into the UK, what, what was your experience? Because I, I I imagine pretty much immediately they recognised that you had a fake passport. It was. It, it's a long story. There, um, it's a uh, when when the, I arrived back here, they I was. Um, handcuffed i was taken by the police and there was an incident on the plane where um i was traveling with two other um, refugees from afghanistan we were given instructions to destroy our passports upon landing here but two other refugees they went and tried to burn their passport in their toilet uh, on the lavatory um, on the plane when i tried to do the same thing there was already smoke from the other two passports and then they realized that uh, uh, they might be burning the whole plane down or something like that. So they mm. called for a police force to arrive. When we arrived in Heathrow, we were welcomed by uh, so many police uh, cars. We were handcuffed. We were taken to a cell um, and interrogated. But the interrogation mainly actually went on uh, for a uh, um, couple of things. That was uh, for having uh, the fake passport. That was the main one that... that uh, yeah. uh, although I was telling them, you know, I fled Afghanistan... You know, I've been given a refugee status. You, you should actually check your records. This is exactly what the people told us. They said, no, this is actually a fake passport that was given to you, and we are charging you for it. And I don't know what charging means uh, at that time. Uh, but then, you know, whenever I, we talk about adversity, we talk about human compassion as well. I was very lucky to find Hakim again, my friend Hakim. He found, I found his number. I called him from uh, uh, Feltham which I was locked up in Feltham there. Um, and uh, I told him that this is where I am. Uh, he was absolutely bemused. Uh, he was like, what on earth are you doing there? Uh, I told him the story, what had happened. He came uh, and then he found me a uh, solicitor. He found me a solicitor, which later on sent a barrister to fight my corner in the court. And he did an amazing job. And I'm still in touch with that barrister still. Really? Uh, he, <laughs> he, he actually was the one who took me to Cambridge University years later uh to <laughs> because i didn't have a family to take me uh to uh take my uh, equipments and everything that i had with me to move me back there again my point here is that the kindness that was shown by hakim my friend then by the barrister to fight for, on for on my corner then he gave me his card as well he told me he knew i was so vulnerable i was 15 years old I was absolutely over the moon because I was safe. You know, I, I didn't mm. care about anything else. I was just safe here. But he knew that I had a lot of other challenges to go through. He gave me the card and he asked me to contact him whenever I wanted to, uh, if I needed help. Uh, and then when I continued to, uh, my aspiration or my kind of my search for education, I went on to work during the day and at night time I started studying. And finally, when I got my um, AS level results, A grades uh, at my AS level result, I called the barrister and I told him the good news. He couldn't believe me that uh, I had achieved that. Because, <laughs> I mean, you, you hardly spoke English at that point, right? I'm assuming your education in English would have been from the TV or VHS videos at the time, because this is pre-2001. So this is, you know, pre all the checks on the planes and, and all the rest of it, and, and quite early in the technology uh, uh, standpoint as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I had to, my grammatical English was, wasn't was bad um, because I'd learned from books. So I knew kind of my grammar, but my spoken English was not good. Um, so I, I had, um, it was really, really patchy. Um, and I had to quickly learn my English. Uh, I was practicing my English when I was working in shops on Edgeware Road with customers. And I was also working uh, as a um, kitchen porter as well. So I would use any opportunity to practice my English. But behind um, all that, my aim was to get to university. Uh, and I'd soon found out about ways to get into university. First, I asked the local refugees how I could actually become a doctor. Um, within a few weeks, uh, well, first of all, what I did was that I was so desperate to find a job because my family was still suffering back in Afghanistan. It, we had a huge family. The Taliban was still in control. So I had to find means to pay for their expenses as well, as well as for the large amount of money that I took uh, for me to, to come here to the UK. So within a week, I went to find a job on, on Edgeware Road. Um, again, you know, I saw kindness in, this, uh, in the eyes of this Irish man. 
who gave me a job within me having any sort of uh, documents or anything else. He took mercy on me, and um, and it was my persistence as well. Even though he was pushing, like he wasn't sure I was too young, you know, be able to work. But I sold it to him that I could actually sell his perfumes, his uh, the cards that he had. I told him that I could speak uh, Urdu, Hindi, and Arabic languages. Uh, so he he was uh, taken by that, and then he gave me the job. So I started working within a week in that, and then I started working at a kitchen porter and did some cleaning jobs around as well. So that was how. I used daytime, um, seven days a week, uh, to literally be able to pay for my my expenses as well as for the expenses back in Afghanistan. But I soon turned my attention to education, and I asked the local refugees who I found out uh, from one another through Hakim, and I asked them how I could educate myself. And they actually all advised me against it. Most of them, they advised me against it. They said, well, we know we all know where we're coming from. We hardly been educated. So they didn't mean any harm. But what they were mm-hmm. trying to tell me is that for me to be smart about using my time, because in Afghanistan, so many families depended on us. So they said, why don't you just keep working hard to make sure that you are able to support yourself, your family members. Uh, you can uh, work in a chicken shop. Then you can start to become a taxi driver. And then one day you will become uh, the owner of a chicken shop. So for them, that was kind of the cycle that they were used to. That was uh, the vision that they had coming here. And of course, these are all hardworking jobs. And I really admire them very, very hardly. But, you know, to become a chicken wing specialist was not something uh, that was my vision. For me, it was more to become uh, a doctor, to heal, to heal my family, to heal the people who I had seen uh, so much suffering amongst them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, reading your story when, when you got to England, how old were you when you when you arrived? 15. 15. Okay. So you're, you're uh, mid teens. You come here, you move into Portobello Road, I believe it is, um, with some other refugees, uh, all sleeping ar- around, you know, in a, in a place that's far too small for you guys. And you're working at Edgewell Road. You're working a number of different jobs to make ends meet and to send money back um, home as well to support yourself. And on top of that, you decide to do your AS levels and A levels to chase your dream of, of being a doctor. W- which university did you go to, uh, college did you go to during that time? So I um, first 1999 until uh, 2001, uh, sorry, 2000, I was uh, purely working uh, and I was trying to polish my English first, you know, to read up on my English. Uh, and I also did GCSEs actually on my own. Uh, on way to to work on the buses, uh, on on return journey from buses late at night, uh, and I love those journeys, the London buses. When I see look at them now, still I remember I, I used to like sitting right at the front, and that would give me a sense of freedom that I'm finally free from conflict, that I'm finally free, that I can actually breathe. Um, that would make me so happy. Those small instances, but that's when I we used to study as well, uh, my uh, English as well as for GCSE subjects. Then 2000 uh, onwards, I started uh, going to a college. Um, that was medieval college. I started doing only two AS levels. I just wanted to test the water, whether, whether I could actually do the AS or I couldn't do it. Uh, and I found out that by the end of the um, uh, year that I got um, A grades at uh, AS levels uh, at those two, then I was encouraged to do more. So the next year I took four more AS levels because I had to compete with this, so many other people coming with amazing educational backgrounds, uh, whether it's private or not private schools, but at least they had a number of GCSEs uh, and amazing marks in them as well. Uh, and the way I was working was backwards from the university requirements. So I found the prospectuses of universities. I went to the admission offices and I asked them, how could I get into medicine? So they would give me a prospectus and I would just circle, okay, the requirement is biochemistry or uh, physics, uh, biology, and I work backwards. And that's how I selected my subjects. Then from 2001 to 2003, that's when, again, I was working uh, during the day. And um, sorry, then I was going to colleges uh, during the day and at nighttime I was studying. And that education went uh, in, in three colleges because I was not allowed to work for more than 16 hours uh, in, in one single college, because I was at the time also um, paying, uh, getting housing benefits. There was no way for me to be able to uh, afford uh, the housing there. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I was um, studying uh, 
during the day in three colleges because I couldn't afford to study in one college for more than 16 hours. That would cut off my housing benefit, which I couldn't afford to pay pay to put portobello rent at that time, a uh, huge rent. And I had to save money for my staff and pay um, uh, for expenses back at home as well. So the three colleges were Maidaville, Westminster, Kingsway and King's Cross and the Hammersmith College. And I had to juggle between various subjects uh, and, and to try to make a, a way out of it. Yeah. And you, you had um, this instance where you were applying for medical schools and you, you got some advice from um, uh, a college tutor about which medical schools you wanted to apply to. And you mentioned Cambridge. Um, what, what was their reaction when, when you said that? Well, I, first of all, actually, about Cambridge, um, applying to Cambridge was not my idea. Um, I was working for British Gas as a salesman at that time. There was another job later on that I found. <laughs> but through that, um, I came across a graduate student from Cambridge University. Um, when I saw him, he, he asked me what grades I had at AS level. I told him I got all A's and he encouraged me to apply to Cambridge. Then he took me on a tour to Cambridge. So I was absolutely blown away. I was so inspired. Um, and uh, I went on, um, there were some uh, open days as well. And the Trinity Hall College, the admissions tutor, Professor Bradley, he was very welcoming. So that really inspired me to apply. Then I came back to the, my college, uh, which was in Westminster Kingsway. Uh, and I told my, t- I told them that I wanted to apply to Cambridge. And so they kind of, the huge bemusement on their face and I said, well, you know, are you sure you want to do this? Because you're going to burn one of your UCAS places. Uh, you're only allowed to apply to four medical colleges, so you, you're going to burn. So that was not very encouraging. And then when I insisted that I wanted to do that um, to apply, uh, and I needed some help with uh, my application as well as with my interview, then they referred me to somebody who was locally known as, as one of the tutors who would prepare students for interviews. Uh, again, when I went into that preparation room with him, he focused mainly on all the things I didn't have to apply to Cambridge. For example, not having GCSEs, uh, not being white, not uh, coming, going, um, coming from, uh, from uh, a private school. Um, and, and everything he could find negative, he just put it in front of me. He said, These, this is exactly what's wrong and, and why we don't want you to burn one of your places. I think he didn't mean harm there but he was just so pessimistic about everything there that actually I just wanted to get out of that room I came out of that room I burst out crying and I was really heartbroken that nobody was trying to take me seriously in that sense but I gathered my thoughts and actually that's how I used my salt CBT as well the the coping technique that I'd used all my life trying to hang on to small bits of successes and for me I just told myself that hang on I've actually survived the bombs in Afghanistan. I've made it on my own to this country. My family is still alive. I'm so thankful for all these things. I'm so thankful to be able to to breathe, to be able to have a roof over my head, to be able to to eat, which I didn't have these opportunities to have good nutrition. So what is it? You know, I lose one place, so be it. Um, I don't care about that. So if the uh, Soviet helicopter gunships uh, didn't take me down. So uh, I don't care about not applying to Cambridge. And that's sort of the attitude uh, I had built uh, at those times that kept pushing me towards uh, actually getting my uh, good grades at AS and A levels as well, because I was competing with people whose English was absolutely amazing. The writing, everything was really top notch. So I had to put actually double hard work. Um, it wasn't that kind of like I came in with uh, so much educational background that I could rely on. So I really worked double. I, I, I bought the, the past papers for so many years. Uh, and, and instead of one or two years, as somebody told me that if you work through past papers for one or two years, you will succeed. I actually bought five years worth of past papers because I didn't want to take any chances. So whatever I didn't have actually for my background, I actually made up for it through my sheer dedication, through my sheer hard work. And I remember coming to the UK with $100 in my pocket. But that shared determination, that uh, uh, steel-like will to be able to succeed continued with me and that kept pushing me as well. But it was quite complex, the situation for me. On the other hand was that I started having these nightmares. I started having these flashbacks as well, which was something I did not know what it was. And that was, Again, I was using the, the test, my tested mechanisms uh, and the coping techniques that I built, for example, doing exercise, 
um, to, to cope with my loneliness, um, using self-CBT, um, and also the gratitude that I was using, plenty of that as well, and my faith to, to never give up on hope. There's always hope. Um, and for, that, for me to be able to serve my family was one of the greatest honors. And that kept giving me that more reward internally as well. But those sort of incidences kept coming that whenever I was standing near a tube, the sound of the tube coming passing near me would just make me jump. And I didn't know what it was. Or for example, when I was walking on the street in London, I would just suddenly see a tank coming towards me and trying to fire at me. That sort of flashback and those nightmares, they kept coming. Sometimes they go, would go away, but whenever I spoke with my family, they would come back. And later on, I realized that they were actually symptoms uh, and signs of the post-traumatic stress disorder that many people living through conflict zone, they suffer from it. There's a very high proportion of people, they, when they leave conflict, they come with their, that mental trauma with them. But despite all that, I managed to get my A-levels and I went to apply to Cambridge University as well. And I succeeded in uh, getting into Cambridge. You talk about having this vision for your reality, these four walls, education, uh, an idea of where you were heading. And that's essentially what you manifested when you went to Cambridge. And I remember you describing the four walls of your of your accommodation and the lawn outside and being this uh, incredible institution. I, I imagine the culture shock of first going from Afghanistan to uh, London and now London to Cambridge must have been uh, huge. And then also you had the PTSD flashbacks to, to, to come deal with as well when you were at Cambridge. Uh, how, how was that? So at Cambridge, actually, uh, the uh, social isolation came a lot more to the forefront. Because I was running on adrenaline for such a long time that I didn't have time to reflect on what had happened in a way that I had boxed my old life my, the years that I'd left um, behind me in, in conflict zone in a box. And I, and I thought that for me, starting a new life is just like that. It's so easy. Uh, but I realized soon in Cambridge that I was actually at, a, at extreme disadvantage. One, socially, I didn't have anybody. There would be families who would come in uh, every month or so. They would bring in food. Uh, they would see the, uh, the young kids growing up and adjusting to the university system. I didn't have anybody with me. Secondly, I would uh, struggle actually financially as well because I was still trying to pay for um, my own expenses. My youngest brother, who came, my younger brother, who came in as well, I was looking after him. But also, I was paying for family expenses as well there, and I had to hide all that from the, the tutors because we were not allowed to work. But also, what happened was that it was a shock for me as well, not having a good educational background backfired here. I didn't know how to actually study. For A-levels, for me, it was a bit easier. Not easier, but only easier in comparison to Cambridge because I relied on past papers. Relying on, I relied on putting everything into my memory, but at Cambridge, it didn't work. So I struggled the first uh, year uh, and the first couple of years, I struggled and I had to figure out how to learn. I had to figure out how to compete with all the students who are coming in top of their classes from so many amazing places that they would be just absolutely fluent in everything. I want, and I wasn't fluent. Uh, but again, I didn't give up. And I knew that I was at a disadvantage. I was struggling socially, financially, and mentally as well. And I think that affected me even more at that time, that I realized that I was actually a proper outsider. Uh, although I was now safe, the conflict wasn't there. I had all these amazing things that I never had. But I was very lonely uh, and mentally I wasn't in a great place, but I kept going I, and I still kept using the same coping mechanisms, which was my faith, having being able to look at the positives, to, to have gratitude for the smaller things at night and early morning. Exercise was a huge thing for me. And slowly I paid attention more to my nutrition as well, because at that time it, it was all over, over the place. I was young, but I slowly found out more about nutrition, how nutrition actually worked. Not in a lot of detail, but even on a macro level. You know, I need to have my vegetables. I need to have my fruits. Rather than uh, spending uh, hours and hours on Red Bull uh, trying to, which was actually the case. It was, I was on, running on pure adrenaline, uh, completely on, on uh, 
sleepless nights when I was doing my A-levels, but at, at university, I had to readjust things and I had to look at things a lot more in that sense. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And so throughout Cambridge, you, you were there for your preclinical years and then you made the decision to come to Imperial. Um, we would have crossed paths at this point. So I, I was at Imperial from 2003 to 2009 and uh, I do remember you, but I don't think we would have had more than a, a couple of sentences conversation. And, and I don't know whether that was because you were still isolated or a different uh, social groups. But either way, we, we wouldn't come to have another conversation until you did your incredible NHS TED Talk uh, a number of years later. But what was it like coming back to Imperial and, and, and London? And also, you know, you, you casually mentioned taking care of your uh, 12-year-old brother who went to Willesden uh, and was doing his A le AS levels eventually. But, you, you know, what, what was what was all that like? Well, first of all, I think we're, we're, we're really lucky to have been to um, Imperial College in London. It's an amazing university. It's world class. I still can't believe it that uh, I've managed to go to Cambridge uh, Imperial College and then later on have a short stint at Harvard as well. I think the one thing I would like to mention is that it's the integration, that it takes a while for refugees to integrate as well. Uh, at universities, I alluded to early on that I was struggling on many levels there. And that's why I wasn't able to find really friendship groups. I wasn't able to, because I didn't have the support mechanisms around me, the social, the mental support mechanisms. So for me, it was quite a bit, and my life experiences was so different from everybody else that I couldn't talk yeah. The, the usual chats that you do around movies or around the dramas that you see on telly, they're completely beyond me. I, I'd never been on holidays, so I didn't know what experiences of holidays were to, to share with my fellow groups as well. But having said that, I had an amazing time at Imperial College, and that's where most, a lot of the clinical stuff happened there. Uh, at Cambridge University, it was a preclinical, a lot of the theoretical knowledge that we gained for medicine and back at Imperial College, it was more clinical that we were sent on wards to see the patients. And that's when I started realizing that my, I started actually seeing that my dream of becoming a doctor was becoming a reality, that finally I was able to interact with patients. I was on the wards, I was in hospital up and down. I was absolutely ecstatic about the whole experience, going up, down, staying too late from one ward to another, one patient to another, to trying to actually feel that it was a reality that, that, that I'd made it. Of course, I still had um, you know, issues socially. I was coming to a point later on during the Imperial College that I didn't know where I belonged, actually. I was one way becoming so British, but on the other hand, I had so many values from Afghanistan that I was in between. Um, until quite later on that I had to embrace the fact that I was both. Uh, and, and obviously I'm, I'm a proud Afghan British now, but at that time I couldn't reconcile the two facts together. That loss of identity at that point was a huge blow towards the end of my medical school training. And that kind of hampered me for a year as well towards the end there. But overall, I had an amazing time at Imperial College in London. I still go and to, um, from time to time when I go to Kensington, I pass by and I look at the library and look at the amazing uh, rooms, the canteen uh, and, and all the places that I've visited. Yeah, no, it's incredible. It's an amazing campus. And uh, you're right, it's this incredible opportunity to, to, to study at a world-class institution. Uh, our, our experience of medical school, just hearing your journey, was just so vastly different. And I can understand why you might have had some issues, particularly in your first year at Cambridge, of integrating into that medical sort of fraternity, sorority, whatever we call it these days. Um, and you ended up going to uh, Basildon, um, which also <laughs> was the university, uh, which is the uh, district general hospital that I ended up working at as well in my F1. Yeah, yeah. So I remember those long corridors and those nights as well. And like the incredible staff there as well, like uh, Dr. Rahman, who was the um, endocrinologist there. Um, we got on really well. And I remember the radiologist who, who you know, you've obviously worked with um, an incredible amount since then. Uh, I forget his name now. You mentioned him in the book. Um, gentleman, that's it. Yes, Dr. Samir Khan. I remember as an F1, 
having to go and speak to him about a CT request and I had no idea what I was doing. And he was the nicest man, the nicest man, because for the listeners uh, who don't understand the context, you know, when you go and speak to the consultant radiologist, it's a, it's a bit of a grilling, you know, the, you, the, it's a precious resource that we have in terms of radiology and the use of um, uh, imagery. And so you have to present your case, uh, almost like selling it to them. And I had no idea what I was talking about. I had no idea why I was there. So yeah, no, he's a lovely, lovely guy. He is. He's uh, actually, he's one of the trustees for our charity. Uh, for the uh, Telehill International Telemedicine Charity, and I keep in touch with him on a daily basis. He reports our scams now internationally coming from Afghanistan, from Syria, from Africa, and he advises actually on education as well. Uh, so he is absolutely an amazing guy. Uh, and that's actually when I got inspired to become a radiologist. Uh, first, when I was at Basel, then when I started my foundation year one training, um, I met up. Like yourself, I had to go and ask him questions uh, to get approval for one of the scans. Um, but prior to meeting uh, Dr. Sami Khan, I met uh, Dr. Kaiser Malik, uh, who is another good friend. Uh, he's a radiologist. He introduced me to Dr. Sami Khan, and he told me that Dr. Sami Khan, he really likes the teaching. Uh, so I went to one of his teaching, and he asked me questions what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I had set my eyes on cardiology. Uh, or general surgery, so I was just torn between the two. And then he convinced me that I should do radiology. And I saw that radiology was central and pivotal to so many things in hospital setting. And uh, so by the end of my foundation year one training, I decided that I wanted to do, and I did some uh, audits with him as well. Uh, he allowed me to, to uh, write some papers. Uh, so I wrote some uh, poster presentations as well, which I gave in Liverpool and some other conferences to build up my CV towards uh, going for my interviews and radiology training. But I came back to um, in London to, to complete my foundation year two training in London. And after that, I went back to Basel then because I took a couple of years um, before I got into radiology training. And I used that time to do a bit of uh, the equivalent of course surgical training as a trust grade doctor, uh, acquired a bit more skills in that department. And then I'm 2014. I started uh, radiology training uh, up north. Yeah, yeah. No, it's in, an incredible journey. And I, and I guess, um, actually, before we talk about um, your, your telehealth charity and, and the ideas that, uh, that sparked that, um, you mentioned uh, about integration and how uh, you struggled with identity. Were you Afghani? Were you British? Were you both? Um, and, and I guess that came to uh, help when your, your family, and, and as is the case in a lot of um, uh, cultures from that region, were sort of asking you questions about marriage and settling down. Um, wh- how, did you, how did you deal with that? And, and obviously, you know, uh, married and you've got kids now and, uh, and very, very settled. Um, but, but what was that journey like for you? I think those experiences are, can be pretty personal as well. Um, I don't think I can generalize in that sense because people's experiences coming at what age they leave the country, what age they settle, uh, the people they meet. Some people might come across people that they've left uh, um, some other country. They're coming from a similar background. They might, might find it easier to talk about their backgrounds. They have, may have a lot in common with them. But in my particular case, that wasn't the case. I hadn't met you know, many Afghanis in London. I had met a few sporadically, but not people who are potentially that I could get, uh, look at as, as uh, life partners. Uh, and my idea was that, you know, one day I'll go back to Afghanistan, I'll get married there. And it would have been easier in that sense that because the way I was looking at it is that I wasn't sure whether I would spend in my entire life back in the UK or not. That was another issue for me. So I, I wasn't certain what was happening, but I also had the blessing of my family who told me that whatever made me happy, that I should stick with that, regardless of where um, that person is coming from. It's about love, it's about kindness, it's about love, um, life partnership for life, that I should be able to find that person. And I was lucky later on to find my wife, uh, Davina, to meet her. But prior to that, I had a lot of conflicting thoughts in my head as well, um, and for, the, for the reasons I mentioned, and kept going back and forth to Afghanistan to figure out if I had actually future back in Afghanistan or back here. It wouldn't have been fair on, if I'd got married back in the UK and then had 
deciding that, oh, I have to go back to Afghanistan. Um, sadly, when I went to Afghanistan on several occasions, I realized soon that uh, my future was back in the UK. I had worked so hard and I knew that from the UK, I could actually help better um, in, in Afghanistan rather than me coming to Afghanistan and, and staying there. Although the Afghanistan reconstruction had started, the rebuilding had started, but there was a sense amongst everybody knew, knowing the political system, knowing uh, the, the, the building of Afghanistan wouldn't be that easy. Uh, and sadly, that's the case now, that the war has intensified. There's a lot of war ongoing at the moment. Um, but coming to my own personal life, I made that decision that I wanted to stay back in the UK. Uh, and that's when I started uh, looking for a potential wife as well and, and got on a dating scene and finally met my wife, Davina, uh, in 2011. And we're happily married. We've got two children now. Yeah, I'll was, I was save that romantic story for the book because it's uh, it's very well told as well uh, about how initially you you were thought of as a a, a geezer from uh, Essex. <laughs> I, I, we met in Barclay um, Hotel where Davina was working as a supervisor there. I'd actually met um, there with my friend Mark, who um, we were going to ca have a catch up. And I met Davina and I was uh, blown away by Davina. I wanted to make a conversation with her. Uh, so I managed to find uh, her phone number. Uh, and then when I uh, texted her for a coffee, then she discussed the possibility of meeting me for a coffee with her friends. And when I told her that, oh, I'm living in Basildon, you know, I'm a doctor in Basildon, that's when everybody thought that, oh, I was a, a geek. He's from Basel and maybe a gangster there or some, <laughs> somebody else. Obviously, not everybody in Basel. No, no, of course not. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, for some reason, it has a bit of a reputation. Yeah, totally. Um, so you, you mentioned there about how you, you came to the realization you'd be able to help Afghanistan in a much bigger capacity from the UK and from your position here. When did you come across the idea for the telehealth organization that you now uh, uh, run? Um, and, uh, and what were the foundations for that? So the idea first for me, when, as soon as I became a doctor in uh, 2010, I started uh, looking back into my initial vision that one day I would become a doctor and I'll start healing people. And obviously at in the NHS, we heal people, we help people. But for me, that I'd seen so much suffering around my own family, my own life, but also so many other people, that was my vision to be able to give back in some way that I, I kept, could. I kept going back and forth to Afghanistan every few months during my leave. Uh, and I went to hospitals. I asked them how I could help and to university as well. But I soon realized that actually on my own, I wouldn't be able to help too much. Uh, and for me, to make that huge difference that I wanted to make, it wouldn't be through my personal experiences alone. And I also realized that there were so many other people in the NHS that they wanted to help. I would tell them stories about conflict, about Afghanistan, that how people, they need support. And they said, how can I help? But there was no way for them to take a leave. Uh, it wasn't safe for them to go to Afghanistan and financially it wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have been able to do that as well so readily. So that made me think of finding a way to be able to connect the health professionals living in the UK and uh, first in the UK, now we've got volunteers from across the globe, how people from the NHS could be able to help people back in Afghanistan, medical colleagues in Afghanistan. It took about four years uh, initially uh, that from, from me trying to help and then trying to recruit people to come with me. That didn't succeed. And finally, I came across uh, the idea of telemedicine. Um, MSF was doing it at the time. It's not something I invented, but MSF was doing it in the capacity in the store forward that they were sending cases, not in a life, too much life emergency, but more in a store forward sense that uh, in a non-emergency uh, scenario. And I also saw that in Afghanistan, in the villages, back in hospitals, everybody was using smartphones. They had really um, good smartphones with good cameras and they were using social media as well. And that was the light bulb moment for me to find out how we could actually tap into mobile phones and social media to be able to connect healthcare professionals from the NHS to healthcare professionals on the ground in Afghanistan. Uh, and I didn't know how, I didn't know 
if it would be possible. But as soon as I looked into that idea, I actually stopped pursuing it more. And I discussed it back with the medical professionals back there. I started collecting their phone numbers. Uh, I even told them that I've got a huge pool of volunteers sitting back in the UK who wants to help. And that wasn't the case. But I was visualizing in my mind that that would be the case. Uh, and uh, convinced that side, then I convinced the hospital, the chiefs of the hospital to allow us to do something like that. And I came back to the UK. When I came back to the UK, I, it wasn't too difficult for me to sell the concert because there was, people are compassionate, people are giving inherently. Almost everybody has that ability in them to give, to be kind. And for me, it, it was just telling those stories of what's happening on the ground, the resources the medical colleagues struggle with, the lack of expertise on the ground, and for them not being able to go to conferences to upgrade their education of how much valuable all this could be if they're connected. But then the politics come into, into this as well. Dealing with Afghanistan politics is, is absolutely can be a nightmare. Yeah. So I convince people in the government to allow me to connect because there's a lot of uh, governance issues involved here. There's data transfer, there's clinical governance, there's political issues. And we had to take that permission from the Ministry of Public Health. But luckily, the government agreed to that. Um, and uh, they allowed us to pilot with five hospitals in Kabul, Afghanistan first. And that pilot survey that we did around that showed that many lives were saved and the doctors had a lot of good things to say about the education, about their education that was enhanced through this um, partnership. That they allowed us to roll the entire um, teleheal system to throughout Afghanistan. And we signed an MAU memorandum for understanding with the Ministry of Public Health and they let us get connected to 14 emergency departments and IC departments throughout the country. So in summary, um, Ariane Teleheal, which is the name of the international telemedicine charity that I lead, was founded in 2015. Uh, now we have more than 150 volunteers coming from uh, various specialties, but mainly we support emergency departments uh, as well as the mental health front in Afghanistan, in Syria, in parts of Africa. But we also now enable other international organizations. So one, it's our own volunteers from the NHS, from the US, Canada, and Australia, who dedicate, who allow their time very kindly to be used by medical colleagues on the ground. And they use a system called what we call reverse innovation as well. So through that, a lot of learning that happens, a lot of the experiences that happen on the ground are absorbed by our colleagues here. And we, on our system, we do have the registrars as well who keep learning from those experiences. So we help the, the NHS, uh, our colleagues who never been, who would never be able to, to see a very extreme case of tuberculosis, for example. They would never be able to see a bomb blast uh, on a regular basis that happens in Afghanistan or the trauma as a result of that. They see it on their smartphones and they allow that to happen in their free time, whether it's at home, whether it's sitting on a sofa, whether they're having a coffee in a hospital, they just look at their phones on their so secure social media, and that's how they're connected to, to their colleagues. They're thousands of miles away, they say hello to each other, they learn from each other, they save lives, but also it, it promotes dialogue, it promotes peace amongst them. And that's, I think, dialogue misunderstanding um, to, to remove that misunderstanding of dialogue is a key to peace. And that's actually the long-term vision for our charity is to be able to keep enhancing that dialogue across the globe in a very neutral format, in a very compassionate, in a very giving format. That's uh, medicine. Yeah. I mentioned that our charity also enables other organizations to operate similarly. So we're kind of giving our blueprint to organizations and governments, and that includes to World Health Organization, for which I will also serve as a digital health expert. Um, and we have given it to MSF. Um, we've also given it to Health Education England to support some of the fellows who travel to Africa, South Africa, uh, or other parts of India on, on six monthly rotation. Now we've got an amazing partnership uh, that's going on with the British Association of Physicians of Indian origin. So within the space of one month, uh, in response to the COVID pandemic, they managed to recruit more than 650 volunteers um, from across all the specialties. And as we speak now, the cases are ongoing on the phone. I can see them. So they, these volunteers are connected 
using a very similar format to the Teleheal. So we're one of the partners. So we've given in the blueprint, but they're now using it. And they're giving uh, advice to junior doctors or colleagues back in, in these hospitals in India. And, and at the same time, they're learning from them as well, you know, to see exactly how they're dealing with these um, devastating effects of COVID in, in, in various parts of the India. So they show solidarity. Uh, they exchange knowledge with each other. They exchange experiences with each other. And this is something so rewarding that I see it on my phone that Teleheal has now expanded to such an extent that now what we save lives, our volunteers save lives themselves, but then we allow other organizations to do it as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I know you're a very humble person um, and, and the, the way I keep on describing your, your story is incredible, but you know, to coordinate uh, the inception of a charity during your radiology training as well, I mean, that, that must have been quite a feat. And just for the listeners, because um, a lot of the listeners aren't, aren't, aren't medics, can you give an example of how uh, Arian Teleheal will coordinate a dialogue between a physician in the UK or somewhere, uh, somewhere else with uh, a physician in an ICU or an accident in emergency uh, doctor in, in Kabul or, or another of Afghanistan? So, for example, um, a case could come from an emergency department in Afghanistan. Um, this case could be a road traffic accident that somebody had been struck by a car, they come to the emergency department. Then the doctor who's dealing with that case goes through procedures to stabilize that patient. First of all, make sure that the patient has uh, survived that tra- the immediate impact of the trauma by lying him down, by making sure that the neck is uh, secure. And they take some x-rays. Those x-rays, images, or the CT scan is available. Um, those images and x-rays are all sent to us on smartphones. They use WhatsApp. So they use WhatsApp. They take pictures of those images, the CT x-ray scan, the lab results. They summarize the case, the history of it, and what they find on the, uh, by examining the patient. They send it all to us, to one of the coordinators in Afghanistan. It's my hostel. And that coordinator then looks at the case as a whole to see what specialists are required for this case. For example, radiologist is required to report the X-ray or CT scan. Then you need an orthopedic surgeon to comment on what's happening with the, if there is a fracture. Uh, if a neurosurgeon is required, for example, if there's a bleed, then we send that case to a neurosurgeon as well. So various specialties now are involved in this case, but all and surrounding that case, which is an emergency to deal with, they give their opinion of what is happening and what should be done next to the medical colleague in Afghanistan. And the coordinator takes all that advice back. Um, in this case, it's all life. The, the, the chat is going live between their clinical colleagues on both ends. Um, and that patient actually does survive because the advice I've given, what to do next on how, what steps should be taken after the initial management, what is, whether it's the four hours later, six hours later, or, or a, a day later. We had a similar case that came from uh, Syria. It wasn't a road traffic accident, but a similar emergency case of a young child who had uh, diabetes, born with diabetes, uh, had diabetes, and, but was in a coma. And they didn't know what the management of that child would be. So that because it's a, such a specialist area, that case came in at night when I was just finishing my emergency department shift. Uh, it, the case came in when I looked at it, I we immediately sent it to one of our pediatricians, child specialist. And that pediatrician immediately coordinated and advised on exactly what fluid management that child should have. Uh, even that fluid management for children is so complex that even if you ask me off the top of my head, I'm an emergency medicine physician now, I couldn't tell you. I have to look it up. Yeah. So you can imagine how doctors actually in conflict zones with few, very few resources have to, to struggle to figure out what to do and what not to do. They send us a video of that child, exactly how much fluid were they on, what they're taking, what medication she was on. And this pediatrician actually from Basel, then Dr. Sanjay Rawal, he is, uh, was my tutor. So he signed up for a teleheal as well. He's still uh, one of our kind volunteers. He was on it, and the whole night he was advising. There was another colleague of, uh, of mine, um, colleague of ours actually for Teleheal, advising from Canada as well, another pediatrician. So they were both advising on that case, and the next day they sent us a video of that child walking with a cucumber in a hand. 
Uh, and in many instances, a case like this would have ended absolutely in, in, in disastrous uh, consequences. Mm. And for us, we were lucky that we had a specialist who could advise on that case. And we've got some of the cases coming with COVID as well. Patients coming in, for example, in, in hospitals in India uh, with severe cases of uh, um, COVID pneumonitis, where the whole lung is what, taken by uh, the virus and but superseded actually by other bacterial infection as well. So very complex cases. And all of that is now discussed with our acute physicians from the British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, BAPIO, and they give advice. They also now provide um, virtual ward rounds as well. Every day of the week, we have virtual ward round. They collect the cases and one day, one of our specialist volunteers, he goes live on Zoom and a colleague from one of the hospitals, they ask them all these questions they have collected around all these cases. So whatever question they fire at them thousands of miles away here, that doctor tries to answer them. Or vice versa, if that doctor is educated by the colleagues on the ground as well. That's how the reverse innovation happens and it keeps happening and the lives are being saved at the same time. When you look back um, and you think about you as that six-year-old child in the middle of a refugee camp um, who was fighting malaria and then TB and your journey thus far to now coordinating and having started an international organization that is providing life-saving treatment and advice, facilitating reverse education, um, being invited to the Global Hope Coalition, doing trips to uh, New York City and being in the presence of uh, UN leaders and celebrities, having BBC programs about your life and, and the incredible work that you're doing with Ari and Telly Hill. W what do you think? It's, it's really difficult to put it into words. I think one thing I would say is that um, for me, it's about the mission. For me, it's never about actually my own life. And I think that's something that keeps me going is that the mission is not accomplished. Personally, yes, it was about me to get education, and that's something that I treasure all my life, that I've managed to escape conflict, I managed to come find safety and then get education. And with my first salary, I bought watches actually from my parents, and that was something that, okay, this is me done now. <laughs> I, I bought gifts from my, especially coming from an Asian family, you have to buy something for your parents with your own salary so they can feel that you have provided Regardless of all the help, the money I was sending throughout the, my early teen and all that, that, that didn't matter. What mattered was that I was a doctor. I was earning a salary and I was, with, the, with that salary, I bought those watches. So that was for me personal satisfaction. But beyond that, everything else was about the bigger vision. And, and if that's something that I, if I could advocate to, to listeners here as well, is that the larger the vision, the more inspired you will become the more fire there will be in your belly every morning that you wake up, that you could do something with your talents, you could do something with the, the amazing network of professionals, of colleagues, or friends that you have. And we can't do it on our own as well. That's another lesson that I've learned through, throughout my life is that it's actually with the power of compassion that so many other human beings have. If we tap into it, we, we can actually solve so many big problems in the world. It's not just about the money. It's not about technology. Yes, I am the one of the World Health Organization digital health expert, but I hardly talk about technology. That comes quite at the, at the end of it. It's actually about solving a problem and having that fire in us to be able to solve that problem. I mean, passion. And the bigger that problem, the bigger our vision. So that's the simple formula for innovation for us, which you're doing as well, Rupi, I know you're doing amazing work, but I'd love to hear about your nonprofit organization. And, and you, you're a fellow uh, NHS clinical entrepreneur. So I would love to know how you've used innovation as well to, to do that. But to summarize all that for me would be that having that fire that was built or, or that I got um, in, in refugee time, I was lucky to have that early on, to have that seeds of uh, passion in me to become a doctor one day, to be able to heal. And now I keep making that vision bigger, bigger, bigger um, every day. But the, the, the principles are the same. Uh, some days which I have, you know, I'm disappointed, some things don't work out and so on. All I do is just I look through some of the pictures of the refugee time 
or some people who are suffering from uh, conditions, I look at the reports, it just starts burning that fire back that I can't give up. You know, yeah. I can't. There's so many people who are suffering, not just in conflict zone and low resource countries, back here in the UK as well. There's a lot of inequality when we look at it from inequality in access to mental health, for example. You know, so many people are suffering as a result of pandemic. They've suffered. Uh, they don't have access. We see it on the quite on the tipping end. They come into an emergency department with full blown crises. We see them trying, attempting very sadly to take their lives, taking overdoses, self harming, mm-hmm. and 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 that's really heartbreaking for me. And that's something that I, I'm I'm putting a lot of efforts into now. How to be able to find a solution for that. Unfortunately, the NHS doesn't have the capacity to deal with all these mental health problems that existed before, and especially after the COVID pandemic, the mental health issues. That's a parallel pandemic that we probably are under, underestimating at the moment, but that is coming to a point that we need to address it. And that's something that keeps me awake at late at night as well, that how I could actually use a similar system to Teleheal which I've founded now at the Aaron Wellbeing, to be able to connect the mental health experts across the country and maybe later on across the globe to be able to address this mental health issue. It's not easy, but it's something, it's a huge problem. And, and coming back to my initial point, is it's the bigger the problem, the more inspired uh, one can become. But it's small steps. It's small steps every day that we take, whether it's uh, speaking to one expert, to recruiting one person, doing one email or that, this all can be very rewarding, but as long as we are looking at the problem in a bigger scale in in few years' time that we're going to solve. Mate, that's uh, it's that's <laughs> I'm just sort of blown away by your your vision, your tenacity throughout your life. You know, it's uh, it's incredible, and it's it's an absolute privilege to to have you on the show and, and talk about your journey. Um, there's so many elements of your story that we just didn't have the time to talk about, but uh, everything's in in the book and. Uh, I just wish you the biggest success with uh, both Teleheal and uh, the well-being uh, elements as well. And uh, oh, my um, my puppy has come to say hi. This is uh, nutmeg. <laughs> She's saying <laughs> She's called nutmeg. She's very cheeky. Yeah, nutmeg. She's nutmeg. Cheeky. We have two chihuahuas. Uh, oh, we dear. have two chihuahuas. One was Louie and Pushkin. Um, oh great! <laughs> Louis Louis died last year, so we have Pushkin. Nutmeg is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, she's a she's a cavapoo, and she's um she's very uh, cheeky and naughty. She shouldn't be in here. She just pushed open the door, and so she just came in. The, they always push the door open. No <laughs> other way you want. You know, they, they they show so much love. I was really against actually getting a dog, um, but uh, my my girlfriend uh, said, like managed to convince me last year, and I think it's just the best addition to our household. So I'm I'm very lucky. Thank you so much for listening to today's podcast, Saving Lives and Survival with Dr. Wahid Arian. You can find all the links to Wahid's book, Wahid's charity, Wahid's BBC documentary that was reported by John Simpson, and all the links to the doctorskitchen.com newsletter, all on the website at obviously the doctorskitchen.com. I really hope you enjoyed it. Please do send this to a friend, rate and review if you enjoyed it, if you found it useful, if you found it inspirational. And I will see you here next time. Thanks for watching this video. If you want to support The Doctor's Kitchen, make sure you subscribe right now, like this video, and check out all the other videos we have right here. Also, go to thedoctorskitchen.com. There are plenty of recipes and other products there to help you live the healthiest life possible.